Uh, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the delay. Uh, we had forgotten the, the, the panel discussion afterwards. My name is Catherine Chatonet, and I'm a marketing manager at the energy division of Erkis Consulting Engineers here in Iceland. And uh, I'm very proud to, uh, or honored to be able to, or to uh, have to chair this <coughs> session on food security and how geothermal can uh, contribute to the big food security issue in the world. Uh, just one word to have you think about a few issues that are at stake here. Um, I was told the other day that about 40 to 60 percent of food that is produced in the world does not in, uh, even reach people because we are not able to uh, store it in a proper manner, dry it, uh, freeze it, or whatsoever. So definitely, if you think that geothermal is heat and electricity, there is a way to, uh, to solve things. And regarding um, the, uh, the growing population in the world and, uh, and uh, the issue of having enough food for everyone, you can think of many other things uh, geothermal can do or can contribute to to produce quality food. So I'm going to let the floor to Sigurd uh, Markusson. He's a project manager at Landsvirkjun Power, our energy uh, company here, national energy company, and he will uh, talk about the future of food and the role of geothermal energy. Thank you. Hi, yeah. Thank you. Good day. Yeah, I think wow. it's a good thing. I couldn't see you. <laughs> I will put it here. Uh, small technical thing here. Too. Here. Yes. Get us Good morning, everyone. And, and I want to start by thanking Georg for the opportunity to, to, to talk at this plenary session. And my talk today is... is, is uh, part of a, a thesis work that I'm doing yeah. at, at the University of Cambridge at the Institute of Sustainability Leadership and also, also involved in, in some of the work I'm, I'm doing at, at Landsvirkjun. And I'm going to talk about the future of food and, and, and the food system and how it is going to evolve in terms of, of, of especially resource use for the next 30 years and how geothermal energy can, can play a, a role and, and, and and especially in, 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 in food production. Uh, well, we all love food, and we all think about food the whole day, and, and, or most of us at least, and, 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 and food is everywhere, and, and it's so intervened with our life, our everyday life. And it's relatively cheap. It's not so expensive today. I think in the past, you know, if you go 500 years back, people had to struggle much more to, to for the food and, 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 and to stay alive. But the global sub food system today is, is huge. It's, uh, it's one of the biggest industries uh, on the planet at the moment. And, and, and it, it, a big part of Earth is, is used for food production. I think it's 37% of land mass out, on the, out of Antarctica is used for food production. And, 70% of water that is used on the planet is used for, for agriculture and, and food production. And this is a very fast growing market. And, and, but food is not, maybe not produced everywhere in a very sustainable manner and it's not produced everywhere. Some, somewhere it's much cheaper to produce food than, other, than other places. So, so for now, it's, it's, we see that, that, that much more food is produced in North America and South America compared to Africa and Asia. But these are the places where we'll see the, the biggest rise in population for the next decades. And, and when it comes to greenhouse gases, food, food production, agriculture, and, and land use change is a big contributor. You see here, agriculture is, is with 13% with of greenhouse gas release. Uh, of all, all the greenhouse gas release you know, emission is totally emitted. And, but land use change is, is even bigger. Deforestation contributes even more to greenhouse gas release than, than agriculture. 
So uh, in that sense, it's very important. We look really well into all the expansion that is taking place in the food production industry and what we are producing food for and what kind of food. And, because, and, and food price is, is heavily dependent on, on energy and energy price, as you can see on this graph here. And because the food energy you get out of, out of the food you eat is probably 10 times more energy that went into producing the food. So it's not a very efficient system in that sense. So deforestation has a, has a very high impact, as I said, on Earth. And, and the food system until now has really changed the landscape on Earth. And, and food production is, is, is accounts for 75% of, of the global deforestation. And as I said earlier, 30% of land mass on Earth is used for, for food production. So it's a really big impact on Earth. And when we're now, when we're looking into sustainability and, and, and how we can avoid you know, having, having all this impact on, on, on the global ecosystem and, and greenhouse gases and, and so on, food production and, and, and new ways for food production is, is a very important thing to tackle. So, and, and I guess most people have very romantic ideas of how farming and food production is. But if you look into the f global food system today, it's a, it's a big industry. It, it, it's huge. It, with, with, it's nothing like, I guess, most people think, you know, s small farms with, of course, they are, they are there as well, but the biggest part is produced on an industrial scale. And, and most of the, of the global environment has been heavily altered for food production. So when, when, when people look at, at the food production of the future and, and rising population, we really have to think of, of you know, where we, which direction will we go because expansion of, of food production and deforestation has, has resulted in, among other things, high and fall of the global or, or or we have lost big part of, of the global wildlife. For example, for the vertebrates, we have lost around, around 58% in only 40 years. And, and we are producing food in very unsustainable environment in some places. Environment which, you know, deserts have been changed into, into, into agricultural land by, by pumping water long distances. But not, with, with high need for energy, and, and we have environments like, like this picture from, from South Spain, where you, where you have, have greenhouses that, that you can easily see from the International Space Station. And, and in this place, they, they have drained the ground level table so much that they, have to, they, are, they are thinking about building a desalination plant. So with, with uh, increased population on the planet and the, the average number out of, out of the forecasts that are being used is around 10 billion people in 2050, we see that, that we have to increase food production by 70% from, well, from how the status is now. And to do that, imagine the impact on the global ecosystem compared to where we stand now. And, and also the change for these next three decades will be that, that the middle class will grow very much. So, so people that have, have strong demands on what kind of food they eat and, 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 and just like the Western civilization does today. So this will have a huge impact on, on the, the food system and, and will completely alter the food system and the food industry as we know it today. And, and this huge growth in the food system Will, will cause, uh, I guess, especially when it comes to water and energy, will change everything. And, and so what got me interested, especially interested in, in this topic related to energy was this, was this single sentence, that we have to produce more food for the next four decades than we have done for the past 8,000 years since, since the onset of plant agriculture. And of course, this is just 
because we have been, the population has been this large for such a short time. So imagine when we have to grow food production by 70%. And there was a, this article in Nature uh, in last October, and which there was this one sentence I, I, I found really interesting, it, is that, that it says that, that the environmental effect of the food system could increase by 50 to 90% in the absence of technological changes. So this really says that, that we really have to find new solutions, and we really have to change the way how we make food. And the key to make food, of course, is water and energy. And, and this is what has been referred to as, as the food, water, energy nexus. So in the future, the key and, and for the, those who, who are going to make food is to have access to energy and have access to water. And just from now until 2030, 12 years from now, we need to increase food energy production by 50%. We need 40% more, more, more water and 35% more food. So, but all the changes that are going on because of climate change and, and, and expanding population, we see that, for example, water stress uh, in, is growing very much in many countries. Especially in countries which are seeing the biggest rise in population, for example, in India and, 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 and China and, and, and Africa. And, and if you look further ahead into the, into the future, climate change will also change the, the, the properties of the soil to produce food. So this will have huge impact also on where we make food. And, and this is, of course, the, are many of the issues which the, which the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals are trying to tackle. And, and, and this, of course, will, will as, as I said earlier, change so much in, in, compa in compared to how the food system is now. And just, um, it has been estimated for the SDGs that, that, that it will create 380 million new jobs by 2030 and cost five to seven trillion US dollars. And when I was reading this, I, I, I thought, it's trillion dollars? Is trillion even a number or is it something, some word that kid makes up? You know, it's, it's, <laughs> so it's, it's trillion dollars is something, you know, you can't get your head around it. So, and, and the key here is, I guess, that we have to realize that, that the economy is, is not something aside to the environment. It's, it's, it's a subsystem of the environment. And for industries and, and, and for, for, the, for the society to, to main, stay healthy and have, have ability to use its resources, the, the environment has to be, be number one. And what I'm preaching here is, is of course something that was forecasted you know, 200 years ago. And, and, and this is Thomas Malthus. He, he, he talked about 200 years ago that, that, that when food production and, and population, you know, when population will rise, food production cannot uh, keep up. And, and you will create like a condition called, called the Malthusian catastrophe where, where you, will see, you will see wars, you will see, see uh, uh, between countries, you will see war around about, you know, land, water, and resources. And, but his theories have been kind of, kind of uh, looked at as, a, you know, this was a guy who didn't foresee, foresee technological development. So he didn't foresee, you know, the industrial revolution, the, you know, the engine, uh, uh, synthet synthetic fertilizers and so on that, that enabled us to grow from, you know, the human population was one billion when he came up with his forecast, but, but now we are more than seven. So, but I think now we are at the point again where we need, uh, we need the new solutions because we, as I said, we, we have to reach the threshold or even, even gone further than the threshold that we have to, for land and how much we can, we can take off of, of, of usable land on earth to, to produce food. And this will of course cause a lot of, of conflict in the future when, when, this, when this person on the right side doesn't get his water because the, 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 the soldiers on the left side close the dam to put it into the agricultural system in their country and downstream, the, the country and the downstream don't get any water, this will cause conflicts and, and, and refugees and, and war and, and so on. 
And this is, of course, something that's already happened. For example, the war in Syria started as a, as a drought. And, 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 and people start to rebel because of the drought. And, and of course, we have to look at first what kind of food are we consuming? And, 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 and because it's very big impact, or the biggest impact, of course, has the food that, that, that is, is, or meat, just to, to say it straightforward, is, is, is meat and dairy and, and so on. And, and, and of course, we, you know, I'm not preaching that we should all stop eat, eating meat, but, but I think the reality is, and, and this is supported by, by system models for the future, is the food system cannot handle 10 billion people with the same amount of meat consumption as today. So, and there are some end of the world forecasts that say, oh, there's no, no way we can, we can you know, keep up doing this. But I think, you know, there, there will be technological breakthroughs and there will be a new development. And, and, and I think this development will be, will be in, in similar to what has happened in, in, in fish production. And, and there I think geothermal energy can play a big role. What, we, what has happened in, 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 in production of seafood is, is the system went from, from uh, until 1990, it was governed by, by catching fish from the, from the, from the natural stocks, from, from the oceans. But when, it was, when, it, when the ocean stocks were, were decreasing and it become, became too expensive to, to catch fish, they started to grow fish in controlled environment where they could optimize all the factors. Of course, it's, it's heavily argued if you should grow fish in, 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 uh, you know, in, in the fjords of Iceland and Norway and, and so on. But, you know, here I'm just talking about controlled environment in general. And, and this has taken over. So, so the, there is still continuous rights of production of seafood, even though the, 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 the catching of natural fi fish from, from, from the natural environment has leveled off. And, and this will continue to be like this. So I think, I think the, the future is, 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 is that farming will move indoors into an environment where you can control everything. You can control all the factors. It, you will optimize the use of energy. You will optimize the use of, use of water, nutrients, and so on. And there, geothermal energy can, of course, play a big role because this is the best energy source available to, to create artificial indoor environments. And, and those who have good access to water and energy, of course, have the best competitive, you know, hedge. For, and so I think we are, we are seeing that, that, I guess, we, you know, we are moving away from the times where, where the farmer has to nurture the plants and, and really take care of them into, 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 well, not, in most people's mind, I guess, not as, as romantic environment for food production. But I think the reality is that if we don't, do something drastic, we will, you know, we will probably kill the rest of the, the wildlife on Earth and, 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 and cause much worse uh, results than, than we already see today. So I think the key is technology and innovation and, and, and the fourth industrial revolution when, we, when, we, when you suddenly can, can grow food in the environment with, with robotics, with analytical capabilities, and without, you know, much in the terrain of the, of, of the humans. And, and where you have robotics and, and you, can, you can, everything is done in controlled environment, optimized for, for the climate that is needed. And, and geothermal can, as I said, create a, create a, uh, in, uh, probably uh, valuable opportunity in this sense, which, and especially if you compare, you know, this is a this is a, a graph you made of, of the cost of of heating up greenhouses in different cost countries, and it has been adjusted to to different needs out of the year, and this is the cost compared to 40 he four hectare greenhouse, and you see the cost of doing it with with geothermal energy in Iceland compared to fossil fuel and, and natural gas in other countries. So the, the cost of heating up a greenhouse in, 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 in Iceland is, is much lower than in other countries, and it's renewable energy. So, but in Iceland we are not there yet. Uh, you see, in, 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 if you look at how much energy we use just to light up greenhouses in Iceland, we only use 0.03% of the total energy we make. 
And, and, but I think to start with, of course, we, we, the environment of doing this in Iceland, for example, is not very good. You know, you, 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 don't, you, 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 you don't get rich out of making cucumbers and tomatoes in Iceland. So, so they are not, you know, people are not flocking into, into that industry. People are more, you know, I guess finding something else to do because it's, it's, it doesn't create good, good revenue. So, so we have to look into how we can create more value and, and, and create more valuable product out of what we are doing. And for ex also, for, you know, from a sustainable point of view, it doesn't make sense to export product that are just water, like, like you know, low, low cost products. So there, but there are a lot of exciting products that, that, that are available that, that, that you know, start with production in greenhouses and, and then you have to take them fur much further into the value chain. And the air geothermal energy can play a key role in, in drying, in, 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 in all kinds of industrial processes that, that steam and thermal energy and CO2 from geothermal power plants can ca play a key role. And you know, to name a few, I, I, I often take this lovely product from Finland, Arctic Midnight Sun Blueberry Powder, which, you know, which this brand should be bought to Iceland. So. So, and there are many interesting projects that, uh, you know, tried, you know, so many companies trying to replace synthetic ingredients with natural, like natural flavoring agents or natural coloring agents, and use instead uh, said something, you know, which is made out of fruit, for example. And I think the market for, just for dry fruits, for flavoring agents is going for, is somewhere around $200 billion estimated size, and it's growing like 5% every year. And these kind of projects is where geothermal energy can, can play a key role. And this is something that is being heavily looked at by the retail companies. And, they, and, and I think within very, you know, very short time, renewable energy will come the criteria of, of you know, they, the retailers will not look at it as a sustainable product if renewable energy is not used. If you use fossil fuel somewhere in the value chain, they look at it as a risk for the, you know, they don't want to sell unsustainable products. And this is, you know, was a surprise to me when I started doing this, this sustainability degree that I'm doing at the moment. Most of my classmates come from the retail industry, from, from Tesco, from, from, from uh, Unilever. And they are all trying to fix their value chains because, you know, m most of the ingredients they, they get for their, for the food products, for the processed food comes from China and India, from a black box which they have no, idea, you know, the, the process, what energy is used, what kind of, what kind of you know, salaries do the people get, and, 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 and you know, what, what the, how, how is the environment? Are there any slaves in the value chain? These are the typical questions these people are dealing with. I, this is a little bit, you know, different from the environment we are used to, but I think this is, you know, so this is, among other, the, the, the sustainability issues that are being tackled at the moment. And, and, and I think the biggest biggest pressure is coming from the retailers, not from the producers themselves. So I think this will change, I think, really rapidly for the, for the next few years. And, and so we really need to look into what, what, are, the, what are the potential, what can we do with all the energy that is wasted in, in, in geothermal, especially in geothermal power production. So, so to create uh, the right skills, the right, the right know-how, the right technology, to, to do this is, is, of course, something that, that we have to start to think about already, but, but I think we are not ready to go there, but there are a number of companies, like, like Lilia will talk about later, that are already, already doing this. And, and, but I think this is, is the future, and, and, and I remember talking to the, the CEO of my company, who was, so before he came to, to, to Landsvik, was, was running the, the, the biggest uh, manufacturer in Iceland and, and among the biggest in the world on, on food processing technology, especially for fish. And in 1985, they said fish farming will never be big because it's too expensive. But in only five years, it, it started to, to, to take over because of technological development and, and pressure from, from, from uh, uh, retailers and others because of environmental conflict. So there are a lot of different technologies we can look at and, 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 and of course, some of them are, are more appealing than others, and, and, but we really need to start to think about, you know, what, with, with the sustainability targets in the future and the technological development, what, what we can do. 
and 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 also how what kind of business opportunities are there because of of for example one of my favorite example is is the Friedheimer concept in Iceland where you have a greenhouse and 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 the greenhouse is also a restaurant which takes a small space within the greenhouse but they get over 200,000 guests per year and 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 of course the greenhouse is probably just a small industry now only sustains the restaurant but you know this is a kind of a innovation that that can be done with when you're mixing together you know tourism sustainable production and and, and geothermal energy and there are some interesting opportunities also for the geothermal people here you know what how can we optimize our use of energy when we are producing from geothermal so see this is for example one of the power plants in Iceland and and the energy energy flow diagram from the plant and all the energy that goes just into into cooling for example in the in the in the in the process that could be possibly used for for something else you know probably you know I will be killed by some mechanical engineer later on but you know for for bringing up this idea but you know could we replace cooling tower with a greenhouse for example you know just as a, as a crazy idea so I think this is the key for us to 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 you know focus on innovation and, and let let you know see if we can can't you know make geothermal be a big part of 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 this food this revolution that is coming up and but there are a number of challenges we have to especially in, I think you know in the environment here that we have to look into and 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 we have to move from from a small scale to a bigger scale and 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 we have to look into to you know what are the barriers and i think there are there are a number of barriers already built in the system because system was was in iceland was created for big solutions you know big scale industry heavy industry and and that has to change and and i think one of the one of the key things is, is i think i'm i'm ending Many of my talk these days with, with, with a picture of the, of the United Nations Sustainability Goal number 17 is the, is the partnership for the goal to work together, create a create kind of coalition to, to you know, make innovation happen. And, but there are also other solutions in, and if, if, people, if people want. And, and so I'm going to end with this. And you can think about it and look at this. For <laughs> Thank you, Sigurdur. I think we will keep questions for the panel discussion afterwards. So we will move on with uh, Sigurdur. Wait. Bogason is a consultant in uh, funding and is uh, working with uh, Georg, among other things. Sigurdur? Sure. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a further background, I'm a food scientist by training, but have been dragged partially into energy research as well. So I'm trying to combine in this uh, presentation visions from both ends of the spectrum, because what is food? It basically is energy. Uh, the planet we live on actually uses the sunlight to conserve energy into proteins and, and all the nice things that we like to consume. But any industrial production of food requires, basically, as Sigurd said, fuel, of, most often fossil fuel. So we need a paradigm shift in the way we produce to feed the 10 billion. So just to give you a little bit of background, I, I will go quickly through it because I think Sigurd has managed to do most of that, I'm just finding my pattern there. Um, so the talk will talk about the environmental limits very quickly, further background to what Sigurd was uh, mentioning. And then as well going to the food, water, energy nexus, because l looking at the research funding programs, you see these words coming more and more frequently. So for me, they create opportunities for people wanting to do things differently. So opportunities usually come from challenges. So going to the food, uh, I have slightly different figures on some of the issues than, than Sigurd presented. Uh, maybe a bit more bleaker picture. Uh, we can see from a very recent Nature article that uh, we are almost up to the level on greenhouse gas emissions. 
So by 250, if we do nothing, we can't survive as 10 billion. So Malthusian catastrophe is immediate unless we change the system. So COP21, people talk, but do we act? That is a big question. Another uh, background, uh, you mentioned the, the meat animal system. Uh, I propose as, as well, because of land, land use issues and things like that, and energy, we have to think in terms of different types of agricultural systems. And another point is this uh, water issue because foods are actually water. And I, I could say, as you mentioned, cuc cucumbers, just a, an idea. Uh, we stop selling cucumbers, but we start selling water packed into cu cucumbers. And they will cost a lot because they are made with Icelandic water sustainably. So each cucumber going to Saudi Arabia will cost a lot of money. So we have to think to to also totally differently in the marketing way. So we stop selling cucumbers, we sell water packed into cucumbers. So we need out of the box thinking, and that's how you get funding. You need a little bit of screwy ideas, when I'm talking about research funding. Another visionary, I will come back to him later, Bill Gates. This is uh, from one of his notes. Actually, we put all the cows in the world into one state, it's the third biggest greenhouse gas emitter. That's food for thought. Uh, and food production basically is consuming a lot of uh, water and en energy. And actually the water that is actually being used is, is quite important. And like if you talk about South America, there are studies now how much of the water you're exporting in, into animal protein, like nice Argentina and beefsteak. It costs a lot of water, and they are dipping into the groundwater. Spain and Portugal actually are tapping into, into the groundwater in such a fast rate that there is an, almost no possibility that they can continue without going into more expensive desalination systems or whatever. That they again will cost energy in some manner. So, to go more quickly, when we have these challenges, we need to look for solutions. And it comes together. We, we always have a situation which is, for someone, a challenge, then there's somebody that will have to provide a solution. Otherwise, we can just close the door and, and go to sleep and never wake up again. So, that's the interesting part of being a human. We must be driven by challenges whether it's going to drill for magma or do something new. We need to really go to the boundary of what we can today and think out of the box. Uh, I okay. The, I'm here with the hat of a uh, um, half-breed energy person working for Georg, but also at the University of Iceland, I manage a, a European research project called Value Mix is to understand the food value chains and network dynamics to advise the polit politicians in, in the European Union or in Europe or possibly in the world how to meet the sustainability goals in the future. Okay, we have three more years to work on that. Hopefully we'll hi find part of the solution. But there are definitely synergies between the work in the deep ge geothermal in terms of how to harness energy for different value streams and what we're trying to do there, because fossil fuel is, and animal production is, a difficult system. Uh, some examples. Vertical farming. This is actually from Tokyo. Uh, they, they are probably using uh, mostly nuclear power. But the sit situation with some plants you need to produce them close to market to avoid lost logistics. So we need to be very uh, careful in thinking where to put place and which types of plants to produce in Iceland 
or are we going to produce something different? Uh, we, this is an algal farm in Reykjanes, already employing 35 people, half of them are, are scientists, and uh, I think five of the 35 have PhDs. So this is a high-tech farming for nutraceuticals. It's in operation. We have more and more examples like that coming out. Okay. And as was mentioned, we cannot use slave labor to do this in Iceland. We are only 325,000 to produce mass food. We need to think in terms of the industrial revolution number four, information technology and robotics. So Marel probably will have to think in terms of moving into big scale robotics. Uh, going back to the scene in Iceland, uh, one of the Norwegian companies has put into Reykjanes a, a farm. We also have uh, this nice Icelandic Arctic char. We are only producing about 5,000 tons a year, but we could probably, because this fish loves to be on land, instead of producing salmon in the fjords and have all the debate, we just have to change the economics of this fish and produce a few hundred thousand tons using geothermal because we have, we need a lot of water for this one, but we can do it on shore. Whether the economics will work or not, and we, we did in a previous European project with the University of Iceland uh, Economics Department analysis, and we need to scale up from 5,000 tons of the kind of, to make it into the big league, probably go to 100,000 tons a year on land. But definitely we need lots of geothermal power there. Uh, another idea which is coming out to produce industrial hemp, basically low in TCA, the hallucinic kind of compounds, you have excellent protein, you have other materials coming out of it. And that would actually possibly not be competitive in Iceland, but we can think about the system because this is becoming more, more and more popular in different countries of the world. It's easy plant to grow. And it produces a new system, building materials, whatever. So there are opportunities. But we have to, again, see are we economically compet competitive with another country? California is out of water. But we would have to build greenhouses on a bigger scale than anything we have seen so far. And then we have another interesting development in, 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 in the north, north of America. This is actually a hemp farm in Canada, actually a cannabis farm, high value product for medicinal purposes has now been legalized in Canada. So same family of plants, one of them is actually for food, this one is for something else, but high value market. We have to think in terms of economics and market. And who are the consumers? Actually, People are now looking more st strictly also into the extraction of cannabis into food system. There is a high interest in, 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 in the population of the U.S. to actually consume their cannabis as food. So, anyway, maybe, and I forget that we are dying off possibly in 250. I don't know. <laughs> so, we just have to progress. Uh, coming to the funding, I will try to be fairly quick because uh, I can spend the whole day and, and, and tell you how to get money out of the European Commission, but uh, I've chosen to take one example out of Horizon 2020 and then talk uh, very quickly about what's coming in. New program, they're still debating in Brussels whether it will be 95 billion or 100 billion, not trillion, but it's plenty of money. And we don't know exactly how it will be structured, but it will probably have uh, similar opportunities because global challenges are the same, climate change, lack of situation. So just to give you a short overview, this is the program. We have basic research, we have collaborative research for the 80 billion within the, in, the, in the current program. And we still have to spend for two years. There's a lot of money out there, lots of opportunities, hard competition. And the, I'm not saying these screwy or crazy ideas work, but when you come out of, with a new idea, something 
challenging, that actually might change things, you usually create a winning proposal. When you try to do the same thing over and over, you lose. Like Valomix, we competed with the old school of thinking in economics. Twelve proposals came in, and our little Icelandic let one won. So we came from a different perspective into this. It's not easy to work the proposal or the project because we were challenging. But that's how the way to get the money. You have to break eggs, possibly some heads, I don't know. Usually food projects are not go going into this uh, uh, program. It's the climate change program, basically. But I, I searched, basically, as we discussed for this con uh, conference, the food, energy, and water security, biodiversity, and air quality. So this seems to be ripe for us to start the first 40-acre um, farm, where it's actually hemp or something else. We just have to discuss that. Uh, in this call, which is actually with a deadline for the first phase of the project, would be in February. So we have actually started to think about forming a nucleus for a consortia, if anybody is interested, but we need foreign part partners as well. But there will be a, a probably three to, three to five projects funded to deal with this issue. So that's how the European Commission programs are kind of top down, but we have to come with a solution, meet the challenges they have recognized. Just to give a little bit in any of these topics, as in, uh, from the collaborative call, you can find funding lines that could mix energy, geothermal, and food production. We just have to think out of the box. Tourism is al also mentioned. There are calls for the Arctic region, food and, and energy and, and Arctic region. It mixes. So think out of the box, create a different perspective, provide a solution. Then the smart cities and communities, <coughs> vertical gardens somewhere, but how can we pipe the geothermal over to Europe? So I'm, I'm probably out of time. So we have many different kind of funding mechanisms within the European programs. Uh, I was go going to give you a, a chance to see a visionary that uh, our esteemed colleagues from the, it should be a video. Does it have sound? Without substantial change, getting the greenhouse gas emissions down, we are on a path uh, to large increases in the planet's temperature. You hear a lot about the progress in reducing the cost of renewable energy to make electricity, but generating electricity isn't the only contributor to climate change. It accounts for only about 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions. With greenhouse gases, you have the electricity sector, but you also have manufacturing, transportation, agriculture, buildings, as well as about 10% from other sources to get to zero emission. Agriculture, this is a category that often people forget about. Cows actually emit quite a bit of methane, which is one of the more powerful greenhouse gases. And so inventions like artificial meat may have to play a role here. And the point here as well is that Bill Gates has paid, taken bulk of his money to the European Commission to create a new fund for new ideas in energy. And so we still haven't seen the call coming out, but uh, this will be through the Horizon 2020 mechanism. So there are opportunities. We, I'm still hunting to find out exactly what he will fund, but it will be with the guidelines and, and rules of the European uh, framework program. Uh, you notice that uh, he said 24% uh, greenhouse gas, gas emission from the agriculture, because he was quoted in the American system. The European system more or less is about 14, or even less in Iceland. So there is a difference between countries and regions. Uh, we have the investment banks, like these, these ones. I, I checked for the geothermal projects. Iceland has gotten about 845 million euro for, for hydro uh, power and geothermal power plants 
these are, these are investment loans. So when we build the big greenhouse in the north, wherever, we have lots of en energy, we need probably to fund it through investment banks. Then we have the uh, European uh, Emission Trade System. They funded a number of geothermal projects in, in the first round. There is a new round coming up, probably will be published next year. Iceland did not participate, but they talked about putting 450 million into, and that probably would be partially for geothermal as well. But Iceland will have to act to be involved. So, how to grow money? I'm, I'm towards the end of my presentation, basically, and rather than answer questions if, if later on, you have to plant new ideas to grow money and solve the situation. And there are a number of, just to give you a, a flavor, it's not a complete review, but there are a number of opportunities. You just have to put on special glasses with a, a non-filter and say, what is my problem? How can I provide a solution? And it's not easy. If you put in four proposals, you're lucky when you get one funded. But anyway, so far I've managed to get about 50 million out of the system. So. Thanks. Thank you, Sigurður. I noticed that you uh, mentioned 80 billion euros in the Horizon 2020. It's maybe a drop on, on the way to the trillion dollars or euros your colleague Sigurður talked about. Now we're going to, uh, to go a little bit on, on the other side of, uh, of uh, the system uh, with a story from uh, Lilia Kjellarsdóttir, who works at Saga Natura, uh, telling us about uh, the viewpoint of the, well, the producers. Oh, no. Eru, hvert fór svona hjálti? Getur ekki hjálpa mér? Það er ekkert að virka. Einhver bara. Escape, er það ekki? Ég veit ekki hvar hann er búið að geyma þetta, sko. Nefnilega, þá sjá, reynum eftir. Hjalti. <laughs> Just to tell you, well, well, Hjalti will find out about it. I don't know where I started the, uh, the presentation, so you have to find it for me. Uh, just to tell you, because we started a little bit late, uh, we will take the panel discussion after uh, Lilia's and Ragnar's presentations. And uh, if it's okay for you, uh, we will start uh, lunch uh, at half past 12 instead of uh, quarter past 12. Yes, Lilia, you're here. All right, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Georg for inviting me to come here to talk about our little success story, uh, which is Kinatura. Um, I'm a, I come from a little bit different background than most of you guys. Uh, I have a PhD in biomedical science and was studying type 2 diabetes for my graduate work and for my postdoctoral studies. And so when I think about the population growth, I don't think only about the problem with food, I also think about the quality of food and how we can keep people healthy. And that's one of the things that, you know, we are partly doing at Kinotura because we are interested in uh, really healthy molecules that we find in food products. All right, so this works, right? Do I point like this? Okay, all right. Okay, so we actually just changed our name to Saga Natura. Previously, we were Key Natura, but this summer we merged with another company that's doing a similar, uh, similar thing with nutraceuticals as Key Natura. So Saga Natura is a green, uh, vertically integrated biotech company focusing really on consumer health products from algae and also from Arctic Angelica from the other side, uh, from the, the other company. Uh, we at Kinotura and the products that are sold on the Kinotura brand 
are uh, high quality nutraceuticals that are based on astaxanthin, which is the world's most uh, powerful antioxidant. So our focus is on export and exporting Icelandic health products. So for green energy and geothermal energy uh, and clean water, all of these uh, things play a huge role in our marketing strategy because people uh, from different countries, they think of Iceland as really a clean country, which we are, and that we produce high quality, quality algae and high quality food. So it's always beneficial that we can say that we grow our algae using green electricity in really clean water. So I'm going to start off by telling you, just skip over our history briefly, and then I'm going to back up a little bit. So in 2014, not so long ago, Kinotura was established. In 2015, Kinotura started, uh, uh, it was uh, welcomed into the program called uh, Startup Energy which is part of the reason why I'm here today. Uh, in 2016, funds were raised for the first time, and uh, we got uh, 2.5 million euros uh, in funds from Eiris uh, Brotar, uh, and investment fund here in Iceland. And this was to start up our manufacturing facility and uh, get uh, the manufacturing facility up and running so that we could produce and market our first products. In 2017, we had the first product in the market here in Iceland. So we think about the Icelandic market more as a test, test market for us. And we are aiming to have about 80% uh, of our income coming from export. <coughs> this was the year also in 2017 where uh, there was a collaboration started with another company that's called Saga Medica, which has a, a longer history than Kinotura, but that company was established in 2000 and has been on the market for a really long time, had good relationship and good sales channels in different countries, uh, in Nordic countries and in the USA and Canada. So this was a really a situation where one plus one equals three. So we could, both companies benefited from this collaboration. This year, the, uh, we submitted the first patent on the Kinotura site because we have been establishing or we've been developing a new photobioreactor to grow algae or microalgae. There was also uh, finalized the second round of funding and after this funding we were able to uh, finalize completely the merger between these two companies, the Kinatura and Sagametica, which now we are called Saganatura. Uh, we are also right now in the process of scaling up manufacturing again. So right now we are at uh, 30,000 liters where we're growing our microalgae and we're going up to about 60 uh, to 70,000 liters. So this is, uh, these are the two arms of the company right now. We have uh, Kinatura that has uh, these uh, microalgae greenhouses. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how, these, uh, how this technology is a little bit different from the technology that's most, that you see most of the time with microalgae. So these are algae that are grown, grown inside. Right now we're growing Hematococcus pluvialis and extracting astaxanthin from it. We are also starting to look into other strains of algae that are also high, have a high value, uh, high amount of protein. And some of them are also going to be needed uh, some geothermal water to keep the temperature at uh, sufficient levels for them to, to be happy and growing. On the Sagamedica side, we uh, have wildcrafted Angelica Archangelica that's harvested uh, by hand on an island called Trise in the north of Iceland. And from this uh, plant, we make extracts, water extracts and ethanol extracts to, pr to produce several different products, including the cough drops that I've been trying to uh, get into me today because I have a cold and I was worried that I might like run off stage with a uh, uh, coughing, but hopefully I'll, I'll, uh, uh, that won't happen. So here are some of the examples of the way people are growing microalgae today. There is the open pond technology, there are tubular systems, and then there are flat panel systems. Uh, most of these are, are okay. The open pond technology is not something that, you know, that we think of uh, both the tubular systems and the flat panel system to be uh, produce a higher grade 
product because you have a highly controlled environment, uh, you can uh, ensure a good supply and uh, safe product and quality of product uh, in any type of climate, even here in Iceland. So Kinatura didn't actually like any of these uh, uh, possibilities that were uh, available at this time. And in 2013, uh, the year before Kinatura was established, the discussion was that, okay, we need to think about a different way to produce algae. And we wanted to make a tank-based photobioreactor. This way, you, we can actually minimize the square footage we need to grow the amount of algae. So we can actually grow 10 times more algae per square footage than any of the other systems, and even uh, 100 times more than in the open pond technology. So this is, you know, some of these crazy ideas, like Seyur was just talking about. People really didn't think that it was, this would even be possible to grow algae in tanks. And it took some time to develop, but uh, there were big leaps in between different prototypes. And just to show you a little bit of the timeline, uh, in November 2015, we uh, were first able to grow algae, or at least keep it alive, in a tank. And, uh, but this was not a really good photobioreactor. And it was made from plastic, and it's right here. Before that, the microalgae was grown in bags. Then a short, short time later, in January 2016, there was uh, another prototype that was much better, uh, but still not optimal. And then in 2016, in September, we had the first 7,000 liter big unit, really well operational. And uh, today, we have this version here. So this is going to be prototype number, number six in line. And uh, this one here is a 7,500 liter unit. We are getting two 10,000 liter units uh, just before Christmas this year. So we're really looking forward to it. Right now we have, uh, the system is computer operational. So we need minimum amount of manpower to be able to grow the algae. It's really easy to scale up because it's kind of a plug and play system. It's easy to, uh, to, uh, put it together, and we, uh, what we do is that we have different manufacturers in different countries produce the different parts, and then we assemble it all together in our facility. So there's no one manufacturer that has the, the, whole, the whole spec of, of the photobioreactor. We got the patent, or we got submitted a patent this year. Uh, we have, one of the th key things for the patent was that it will have, the, both the working conditions and the way that how it's cleanable. Because this system has, has all, uh, uh, it's really easy to disinfect compared to the long tubes that you have in a tubular system. Also, one thing is that the amount of food that we can grow uh, per square footage is, is a lot. And if you think about uh, per year, or on a yearly basis, for the algae that we're growing now, we can grow about uh, 500 tons per hectare per year of this product. And when you th compare this to, for example, beef, uh, in the uh, the, we actually can grow about 1,000 to 2,000 mo more uh, protein per, uh, per square meter than for, for beef. And this is also good, good quality amino acids that you're getting from algae. One problem is this consumer acceptance. We need to kind of try to find a way to hide the algae now in products, but I'm sure that there are going to be some innovative food scientists in the future that can solve this. So right now, we are focusing on growing Hematococcus pluvialis. And this is because right now, growing algae is a little bit too expensive to just grow protein. So, but this way, we can further uh, develop our technology and take big leaps and at the same time produce high-value compound uh, astnathin, which is the red color you see here. Uh, here are the cells of the microalgae, and the red color here is astnathin. And it's the same chemical that, that, or same compound that makes the flesh of salmon pink. And the price per kilogram of pure astnathin is about 10,000 uh, US dollars. So it's a very valuable compound. What we do is that we use this uh, astanthin for supplement products and nutraceuticals. Uh, astanthin is the strongest antioxidant known in the world today. 
It has about 1,800 uh, 1, articles on, published on uh, today. Uh, uptake and distribution is really good. It crosses, for example, the blood-brain barrier. And there are articles uh, about the beneficial effect on, on muscle, on endurance, uh, on cardiovascular system. Think about the uh, blood protein, uh, blood lipid profile and the cholesterol. It's, it has good effect on brain, <coughs> eyes, and skin. And what it does, uh, the, a lot of articles are actually focusing on the effect of asnathin on skin because it can protect our skin from the UV and the harmful UV rays. And this is actually one of the reasons why the algae is producing, starts producing asnathin, is to protect itself from oxidative damage and damaging UV rays. So here are some of our products that we have uh, today. We are selling bulk products. We are selling both the uh, asanthin rich oleoresin, or this is oil that we extract from the algae. We also have the algae pow powder, which is uh, asanthin rich. And then we have different products that we also have on, uh, on the ice landing market. And then we also sell all these products uh, in, as a private label ab uh, abroad. And this is our newest, uh, newest member, which is Asta Skin. And this is also the first product that we use the, the algae mass itself. All the other products are actually using the oil. But there are very interesting compounds actually just in the whole algae also, because there are uh, different uh, glycans and carbohydrates that might have beneficial effect for the immune system. And this we can see in, in other algae also as well. All right, with this, I, I would like to thank, of course, uh, Startup Energy, uh, as they uh, kind of started this uh, journey with us. Uh, we have gotten really good uh, funding from the Icelandic Technology Development Fund, and then the uh, Icelandic Innovation Center was, has been a uh, really important partner in designing the photobioreactors. And uh, with this, thank you. Thank you, Lilia. This, this has been uh, very inspiring. So now I will welcome uh, Ragnar. Who is? Where are you, Ragnar? Yeah, here you are. <laughs> so uh, for another success story on how. Uh, we can produce food with the help of geothermal. And Erve, Kjelti, how are you Night. So Ragnar comes from Jurt Hydroponics. Uh, I understand you're in uh, Eilstavir on yes. the uh, eastern side of Iceland. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing your story. Hello, my name is Ragnar and I am going to tell you about our company Jurt Hydroponics. Um, we founded our company in 2015 when we were studying engineering at the University of Iceland and we really got into thinking about what we could do here in Iceland to use our resources in the geothermal heat and hydroelectric power, water, air, to produce some high quality foods for export. We have great knowledge in uh, horticulture and inside farming but we have never been exporting vegetables for instance and to do that, we have to do something new uh, and it also have to make products that fit into uh, the export market. So we found out that we could grow wasabi here in Iceland because uh, it fits quite well into the climate and it has a market price that we can uh, live with in export. Uh, Nordic Wasabi is our brand and it is a fresh produce from our startup company, Yurt Hydroponics, 
and we founded it in 2015 and we specialize in growing sustainably high-end crops using our resources in Iceland. And our first uh, product is the Nordic Wasabi uh, for delivery to restaurants and gourmet retail. Um, like I said, we are not uh, exported vegetables from Iceland. Uh, we mainly focus on general crops like cucumbers and peppers. And if we want to export vegetables, we have to make something uh, that can't be made cheaper elsewhere. And also it has to uh, be an interesting product and it has to be, we have to be able to grow it in Iceland, of course. Uh, and the wasabi plant fits well into the Icelandic climate. Uh, it grows naturally in the mountainous, mountain regions of Japan. So it likes to be a bit cold, but it also needs very stable conditions. Uh, and we can do that here in Iceland uh, using the geothermal heat and the cold air outside to keep the temperature inside always like we want it to be. But what is the wasabi that we are growing? Uh, it is a plant that comes from Japan, and it is the stem of the plant in the picture that we use uh, to grind it down and make fresh wasabi paste. And nothing is added and nothing is taken away. Um, but most of the times, uh, wasabi uh, is not wasabi at all. 95% uh, of all wasabi, for example, served with sushi in the world is horseradish with food coloring. So it's just a fake mixture that is no, has nothing to do with wasabi, but it's called wasabi. So real wasabi is just 100% vegetable and are very uh, rare to find. Um, so real wasabi today is mostly presented in restaurants and sometimes it is uh, even grinded down in front of the customer so it's also a real experience to have it uh, and the taste is much much better than from the fake wasabi and also you're just eating clean vegetable whereas a highly processed product from food coloring um, the unique wasabi taste awakens in a chemical reaction that happens when we grind down the stem. So you have to do something to let the taste come out. You can't just take a bite of wasabi and it's really strong. You have to grind it down to make the taste come out. And this is how it's done. We take the, the stem of the plant and trim the leaves from the top and grind it down on a shark skin from Japan. And also we use all of the plant. Uh, the leaves are used for salad and this decorations and the flowers are as well. And they are really popular in, in the cuisine. Mm, like I said, the wasabi is most commonly used in sushi, but with real wasabi you can do anything you like. Uh, it's very popular in Nordic and fusion cuisine. And they even make uh, cocktails with it. Here is uh, the wasabi with the sushi at the fish market. And here we have the cocktail wasabi mule. That's a really interesting product. And also with red meat, it's really good. So we founded the company just after graduating from the university and participated in the accelerator program Startup Reykjavik. And it gave us a lot of credibility coming out uh, of engineering two guys with a crazy idea to grow wasabi. And we received in funding $500,000 in February, the year after, and now have received uh, $1.2 million in funding. And we are now have an office in the Ocean Cluster and share an office with other companies doing some, of, some are in food production as well and also have met investors uh, in the house. So we started in a 500 square meter space in Eilstad in the east of Iceland and uh, expanded to 1000 square meters uh, uh, just uh, the same year we started growing and are now in 2000 square meters and are expanding to 4000 and this is the facility uh, high-tech greenhouses, uh, fully automated. So now the house on the right side is full of wasabi, 
and the on the left side soon to be but uh, like uh, many have talked about here today um, what we need to grow food in Iceland um, we have a lot of untouched nature and clean air uh, it is good for making high and cr uh, food but also the consumers are thinking about where the food is made and it is uh, very good for us when we say that it is made in Iceland with the clean air uh, not polluted and of course the water uh, wasabi is in fact a semi-aquatic plant so it needs a lot of water to grow and in farming uh, water is one of the biggest components and like in Spain where they are drying up the forest to use uh, to grow tomatoes uh, here in Iceland we are pumping out fresh drinking water to uh, grow our wasabi so it is the same water as we drink that we grow uh, wasabi with and we also think of it like that uh, we are growing one kilo of wasabi in Iceland it is a long process to grow it takes about one year so we use several thousands of liters to grow one kilo and then we export that one kilo instead of all the water and in that way look as it as a, a water export company and of course the geothermal heat is necessary in Iceland we have cold winters and we can make stable conditions inside all year and finally the hydroelectric power we use it for artificial light and it is very important to us that we have it certified as 100 percent renewable and when we have made the product we have to get it to market and we are well located in the middle of the atlantic ocean uh, short routes to europe and the us and we have great experience in that in the fisheries and we are using that knowledge to export our wasabi uh, just a few pictures from when we were putting up our facility digging for the power and this is how it looked like when we got in and this is how it looks like today so we have everything automated we have the light and curtains uh, windows humidity uh, the growing process is fully automated the only thing we have to do by hand is the harvest itself and we also put a lot of work into marketing and branding our product and we chose the name Nordic Wasabi and it has, has been a great hit in the market uh, people like to buy high-end products from the Nordic region and this name could also go into other crops like Nordic ginger Nordic chili for instance and also we have had a lot of interest in our company since the beginning just uh, when people hear that someone is growing wasabi in Iceland they want to hear about it and here is the president tasting it and you can see on his face that it has some taste to it uh, so what we want to do is deliver fresh high quality produce from Iceland to demanding markets and like in this picture where, where we have mixed up uh, our wasabi with fresh fish from Iceland this uh, we could do with so many more food so this is really the vision of our company to grow high quality cr crops in Iceland and to offer the whole dish uh, to the restaurant from the same place so thank you Thank you very much. Well, everyone is getting angry here, no? Uh, I will call the panelists now uh, to the table here. Yes. <laughs> uh, but there are two new uh, people here to, uh, to the panel. Kirsten uh, Valla, I think, and uh, Ragnar. So if you can <coughs> come, ladies, maybe, and uh, introduce yourself, that would be very good. Kristin Valla comes from ATS Orca. Uh, the resource park in uh, in the Reykjanes, and uh, she brings maybe the 
geothermal uh, producer uh, point of view on that. And uh, Ragnever comes from uh, Sweden. Yep. And she brings maybe also another point of view uh, from the uh, producer's point of view. And I'm forgetting you. You're new also, uh, Johan. Sindri Hansen uh, is the colleague of uh, Ragnar, uh, who was presenting uh, um, Yurt hydroponics uh, just before. Maybe you want to tell a word on yourself before we start, or is this enough? That's good. That's good? Okay. So, wait. So, I will welcome any questions from, uh, from, from uh, people here uh, in this room. But uh, I would like to start by thanking all of you uh, for these very interesting presentations. Uh, I hope you can get a little bit of inspiration, uh, be it on innovation on, or thinking about new ways to, uh, to use geothermal, new ways, but some maybe not so new, some of them. Uh, I like what you said, Sigurdur, uh, that you have to think a little bit out of the box. And uh, it seems to me that it makes sense to use uh, geothermal to produce food and uh, to bring new ways to produce food as, as well. Um, but there is still a long way to go, obviously. Um, I would like to have your thoughts on uh, what should we do to spread the word? Uh, if you are asking in general the production of food, it's part, the big part is economics and, and logistics. So the market and that has come through uh, the retailers are driving for cleaner production and, and, and more uh, sustainability being proven. So the issues are basically as well the health of what we consume. So all of these uh, pressures on the food system need to come together and for uh, food production in Iceland we need to really use the opportunities that the country gives us which are different from many other countries we are in some cases close to the market, like for the uh, wasabi, because it's uh, ex exportable by, by flight. Maybe even the uh, uh, nutraceuticals. And when you have compacted the product into something really, really high value, but uh, my case of the cucumbers, you probably would have a big ships f uh, floating, but uh, is it economical? So the question is always, what is the market willing to pay for whatever you produce? And that is usually what people have the hardest time to really figure out. Mm -hmm. And especially, as I mentioned, the Valumix project, 25% uh, of the income of most farmers in Europe are, are, are subsidies. And when you go to the bay, uh, beef production system, 100% of their actual income, when you, the actual income is from the subsidy system. So is it viable in the longer term for the taxpayers to be paying farmers to produce beef? That's a proverbial question that I'm not going to answer, but uh, for longer term, to feed 10 billion, we need to face these questions. Uh, but I would like to ask Kristin well, the same question, because I think what you're doing, or maybe you give us a few words first on what you're doing in, uh, in the resource park, and, uh, and do you think uh, there is something to do to spread the word? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, if I tell you a little bit about the resource park, which we uh, have a sort of foster in the Reykjanes uh, area, uh, the concept about the resource park is to um, to use everything that we are getting from the the reservoir. So when we have uh, used the the fluid to produce hot water and electricity, there is uh, <clears throat> some, something left. There is uh, energy and there are chemicals in the fluid that can be used as a raw material for other production. Um, <clears throat> the most famous uh, company in the resource park is, the, of course, the Blue Lagoon. However, we do have uh, several companies that are using uh, either the heat or, or or, yeah, mostly the heat to produce uh, food products. We do have one of the largest fish farm in Iceland, which we saw uh, in one of the presentations here, 
uh, Stolz Sea Farm, which is ac actually producing a tropical fish in Iceland. It's a, it's a bit strange to, to imagine that we can produce uh, tropical fish in Iceland. Uh, but with use of access heat from the power plant at Reykjanes, this is possible. And we are using the, the clean sea that we have, the clean area, uh, the clean, uh, clean air, clean water that we have. And it's valuable to the end user to have, have the, the whole concept. And uh, there are also two companies using uh, a heat to dry fish, which is actually, or fish products, fish hats, fish bones, which is actually exported to, to Africa. And it's a very valuable uh, product for the people in Nigeria. It's a, it's a protein, actually. <coughs> and uh, I think, actually, I really enjoyed this, uh, this session here and uh, to listen, and ex actually, especially to listen to the Vasapi, or not the Vasapi. They are using everything that we have and all the values we have in Iceland, the clean air, the, the clean uh, water, and uh, the, the clean energy that we he have here in this country, and export a high value product. And this is, this is what we should be doing here in Iceland. I think we all agree that we will never be big. And we heard that from all the speakers, we will never be, be big. We have to focus on quality. Mm -hmm. But what about the producer point of view, <coughs> the energy producer point of view? Is it, is it, uh, does it make a difference for you, apart from um, yeah, doing of something course. good for the world? Uh, yeah, of <laughs> course, because we are, of, we are getting most of our revenues from uh, electricity and hot, uh, selling hot water. However, um, we are also getting revenues from selling these uh, waste streams or, or byproducts from our production to the other um, companies in the resource park. And, this means distributed risk, although it's not, the, not the, the, the quantity, it's distributed risk and it's also good for our image. Okay, questions from the uh, from, uh, room? No? Yes. Um, I, I don't know if we have any microphone. No? If I may jump in very quickly, yeah, the figures vary between countries. Recent survey in the Nordic region is about 25% of the food is wasted. So the biggest consumer probably is the waste bin. Some of it happens in the distribution chain, some of it happens at home. Uh, so in, in other countries, uh, like in Africa, where you have uh, all kinds of critters and things, it may be, it doesn't reach the consumption state because of lack of uh, refrigeration. So there are disparities in this world. So how to solve that is also part of logistics. Often food is not produced close to market. So uh, affluent countries like Iceland, uh, we may be not always doing things correctly. So we need to solve the system problems as well. And a big part of the European funding assumes that you are also looking at resilience and, and, and sustainability. Like in the volumous projects, we have to deal with logistics, definitely. It's, it's always, you have to look at the whole system. And partial solutions are not really the way to feed the, the human race in 250. We need to solve the whole system problems. But energy is probably, the, the energy and water are the key ingredients to survive on this planet. Sigurd, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you have, Lilia, yeah, please. Yeah, so uh, coming from the algae world, yeah. <laughs> I, of course, think that algae is the solution to this. Uh, so basically, 
for example, for our system, you know, the photobioreactors, you can grow m uh, microalgae, and not just the, not, not obviously the Hematococcus pluvialis, but other strains that have, some of them have 70 to 80 percent uh, uh, protein. And you would use 100 percent of the algae, which is, you know, for some plants, you're not using uh, much more than 20 percent of the whole plant. Maybe sometimes, you know, you're only using the root and not the uh, rest of the plant. Or, uh, <coughs> but, uh, and maybe in the future, right now, growing algae is a really a young, young industry, and we have a lot to learn. Uh, you've been, we've been growing uh, tomatoes for a lot longer than, than microalgae. So in the future, I could foresee that farmers would have uh, photobioreactors, for example, and that you don't need to have such high level of expertise to be able to grow them properly. So I think you know part of the part of the solution can also be uh, into changing the what food we are eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think part of this as well is is of course cultural and 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 you know how the respect we have for the food we we, we buy and I think as as people more become aware of of the whole context they or at least I hope they 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 put more respect to, 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 you know, everything that, that is behind the food they are consuming. So, so I think it, it has also to do with, with, with cultural and, 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 and politics as well, you know, to implement food waste into the system and try to avoid it. But, but, but I think, you know, this is also something that I believe that will change a lot, but, but, but it will not solve the, the, of course, even though we managed to fix this, it will not solve the, 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 you know, add up the calorie difference that we need to, to feed 10 billion. Other questions from the room? Yes, Wilfried? Uh, no, it's so too personal. Yeah, okay. In other countries, there's other uses Sorry, in the food industry for geothermal heat, like dehydration. For example, in California, there are companies who make dehydrated onions, which is an easily transportable food product, which is used widely manufacturers say making soup and so on. Then there are also niche markets analogous to the wasabi one. For example, in Southern California, there's a company that has a <coughs> well that produces 80 Celsius water and they use that for heating greenhouses to, to bring to market roses for the Christmas market. And that in, is a high value rose compared to a rose that you sell in the summer. And so you have to think outside the box. And just like in Echaparka, you have tropical fish. We have in the Imperial Valley, near the big geothermal plant, uh, fish farms that grow tilapia. And uh, they are quite lucrative. So I think that we have to think in terms of a thermal cascade. We start generating electricity. And the power plants in Southern California inject their waste water because it's a toxic liquid and it's set to be to maintain pressure. But there's all that entropy going down into the injection wells where these subsidiary processes could take place. The first one is to manufacture hydrogen <coughs> as a transportation <coughs> fuel. Then you can extract valuable minerals and then you get down to the direct use, for example, heating greenhouses, um, dehydrating vegetables, and so on. So we ought to think <coughs> of the, the highest and best use is to use temperatures in different ranges in a cascade, rather than just thinking in terms of building a power plant or heating a greenhouse. You put to, together the system of a thermal cascade Okay, thank you, John. Maybe, uh, yeah. on, on like yeah. oh, yeah. I think that, that fits into the story very well. Yeah, maybe I can comment also on um, the economy of scale and the sizes we have if we look into Iceland. Um, they told us here that we have not been exporting horticulture products from Iceland. Well, the average farm size in Iceland, Icelandic horticulture, is 2,000 square meters. If we 
look into the sizes, the average sizes in the Netherlands is 40,000 square meters, the average size, and they have much bigger farms there. So from 2,000 square meters, you're not producing a lot as a single farmer. And then you are not going into drying, at least not in, in for exports, just in very small amounts. So I think we um, need to make bigger farms so we can make use of drying to go to exports because several people have tried to build large horticulture farms in Iceland and then they stop because of uh, the storage problems and uh, the problems of uh, exporting this water and uh, products that has a very short shelf life. But we, if we can go into a larger, larger companies with the drying process as well, then I think we have huge uh, opportunities in the future. Mm -hmm. John? <laughs> Without having a solution, resilience of the food system, we have a very fragile system on the planet, uh, depending on the sun, because if we have volcanic eruption, we can't get the sun to the plant, so the animals die. So maybe algal farm, some, somewhere hidden in, 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 in close to a geothermal plant, can actually be the resilience solution, but uh, we are not yet there yet. We need to really do the research, do the marketing and find ways. And Bill Gates talks about artificial meat and there is heavy investment now in growing the meat animal free in tanks. So that's, people are already throwing money into the, so, such companies in the US. So animal free meat. <laughs> they say it's about 25 years from now. I'm sure they'll find a way to turn algae into meat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, just one of the uh, uh, Greg from New Zealand. Uh, I, I suppose more a observation and one question is uh, you've, you've spoken a lot about retailers and what retailers demand. And I just like to flip that on the head and just say more about the customers. And I suppose they really want to know about the story and where the food has come from and they really keen to understand the full cycle. Um, so when you're thinking about making a product, um, you typical, if you look at the dietaries, uh, the vegan and all those popular dietaries which have come to fruition at the moment, people are caring about that whole cycle. So it's great to hear like with wasabi, and, you know, they're really thinking about that now. Now, the question I have Jon, maybe you want to start with, what, with commenting on, on your experience from the customer side? Yes. Um, yeah, so uh, using the, uh, the water that we pump up with, the, uh, or uh, used to extract the heat, uh, it's usually used to uh, heat up cold water. Um, of course, we have a huge problem in, in Europe and uh, in many places around the world where the groundwater is actually falling because of being pumped up for irrigation. Uh, however, at the moment in Iceland, we are sustainable, uh, to my knowledge. 
uh, in our uh, uh, pumping up of, of groundwater for irrigation and for uh, human drinking water. So uh, uh, that's not the problem as of yet, since they are uh, they do renewable. Uh, they are uh, renovating or coming up again, so quicker than we pump it out. And there might be problems with minerals for some of the plants. Mm -hmm. What about you, uh, Ragnar? Uh, any views on, on uh, using uh, geothermal water directly in, in, in the process? Yeah, I mean, it depends totally, as they say, where you're taking it from. So in, in some places where you have uh, low temperature and not so many minerals, you can use it directly. Even for fish farming, that was one of the things they found out with the fish farms uh, back in the early days of fish farming in Iceland, that uh, they had uh, heat exchanges all, all places, but they took them out from, from most places where they had a lower temperature of, of the water. So. I think also for, for uh, because there are algae in Iceland, in Icelandic nature, that grow in, uh, in areas and that actually grow in uh, geothermal, uh, in hot water here. So you could probably use the, uh, this water for growing algae. And uh, some of them are, you know, grow at about uh, 45 to 50 degrees Celsius. And a lot of these, actually, the, many of these are cyanobacteria, and they do have a high amount of protein. So if you could find a way to incorporate that into, into the food system, you could use the geothermal water for uh, growing plants. Any more comments? <laughs> well, I, I can comment on this as well. Uh, uh, especially with the high temperature areas, is is it's the water is is maybe not suitable because it's it <coughs> for, for all the hydrogen sulfide we have it, have in it, and and these areas are of course are of the nature as well that, that that in most of the cases we have very good access to cold groundwater in the in the areas <coughs> in the in the active you know plate boundaries sort of country. So so we have we have not, but uh, but I believe this is of of probably of, of, of high importance in areas where, where you have, you know, geothermal uh, power plants in, in, in desert areas, for example. So. By the way, uh, New Zealand is a very uh, excellent example of uh, processing food uh, with geothermal. If I remember well, you process milk, and you make dried milk. Well, that's an excellent example. Any more questions from uh, this room? change in food production from moving from outdoor agricultural environment into indoor environment, which could be a, a major breakthrough in a, in a sense. Uh, so before the food production was located where you had the land and the land mass for the agriculture, and now this could change. So which do you think is more likely to become the future location of this indoor food production? Is it where you have the energy or where you have the customers in, in the cities, perhaps? Well, it, it, there is high on the agenda now to move food production to, to the local environment. But I think in, in places where, where uh, you have poor access to renewable energy, because in the end, I think, I think the total uh, Total, you know, footprint in the average footprint of, of food production is, is something around 20%, if I remember right, of the, of the of the carbon footprint of food is, is transport. So it's it's not the biggest. I think energy is is much bigger. So so in the environmental aspect, I think it's more important to locate the food production where you have good access to en energy and good access to water. But for example, if if you look at resilience of of communities, but then it's also important to locate it. In, in the near areas. So I think it you know, depends on what you're, but especially for the high energy uh, intensive f food processes, I think, it, think the focus should be, be first on, on the areas where you have ac good access to, to energy. Yeah, I'd like to uh, comment on this as well. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, the sector will definitely be where it's economically viable for it to be. So uh, customers might be 
uh, willing to pay a, a little bit premium on products that are uh, grown inside of the cities, for example, uh, because of less uh, pollution or less environmental footprint, of course. But uh, that's, that will only get you that far. So uh, if you're in a high intensity uh, energy or water demanding uh, field, of course, uh, I guess the economics will uh, find the exact location for your uh, plant. If I may just uh, add a little bit on the cascade uh, wording from Wilfred. It's very crucial, maybe in the long run, to have, a, to have the energy systems kind of uh, <coughs> perceived as sustainable in the long run. We designed the system already from starting point to capture all the thermal energy. And we basically have to create the value chain down, downstream from, from, from the start, not only in California, but then you have to think in terms of investment on a big, much bigger scale. But uh, then the question of what, what the location <coughs> of the energy or the market, I think we have to find the solution that is economical because nothing will happen without being economical. But we have to design the system. Mm -hmm. Can I just uh, yeah. add uh, about uh, urban farming? Because uh, there's huge interest uh, about urban farming today. And they just, just funded a cost action on this. A cost action is a network where 38 countries can take part. And it was funded here early spring. And the kickoff meeting was uh, in October. And this is the first cost action that has all 38 countries on board before the kickoff meeting. And there are more than 100 people on the waiting list to get into this. So there's a huge interest for this. And it's maybe not least about the use of waste heat and, uh, of course, less transport. So it will be interesting what comes out of this. So talking about food, everyone's getting hungry here. <laughs> Just a little bit of summary, I understand that there's still a long way to go uh, to make uh, the use of geothermal uh, into food production uh, more systematic. Uh, take the example of uh, here we, we've had here in Iceland uh, and a lot of innovation maybe to do also on, on the food production side. Um, I'll leave you with these words and uh, bon appétit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.